Alrighty, this is the 31st of July. And uh, first thing is to take roll call. Uh, I'm here, Carol, if you want to start off. I'm here, Carolyn Ness. I'm here, uh, Kelly Sharest. Okay. okay. Uh, Kelly Sharest. Good. Uh, we're, Diane, did we hear from you? Diane Martin. Thank you. Yeah, we're emptying the dishwasher at the same time, so I'm muting. Jeannie, <laughs> Jeannie Soika from PVMA. Um, we have Allison Malsey. Allison, are you yep. there? I wasn't sure if I was supposed to. Allison Maisley from Treehouse. All right. I'll get you down here. Hang on a sec. And Chris Harris. Yeah. Well, that pen's no good. <laughs> Helps to have utensils at right. Okay, I don't see any other signs that we've got any more attendees. So if they come on, we can get a name. Um, Okay, Is are there any modifications to the agenda that anybody would like to bring up here? Okay. We move on to the approval of the minutes from June 26. Um, we have draft minutes out there. Um, make I make a motion. A motion. Okay. I make a motion to approve them as presented. Okay, Holly, you're, you're muted. I was trying to be polite and mute here and forgot about that. <laughs> okay. I'm in a quiet room, so maybe I won't, because then I forget <laughs> and I start talking. Anyway, um, so um, I just hang on. I got a couple of things open so I can get to what my note was. Um, the information for the parade debrief was all good. Um, and, and thank you, Peter, for putting um, a complimentary compliment about the work group and everything that was done. I just wanted to separate that from our debrief because right. that was a, a general comment versus ours. Yep. And then at the tail end of ours, um, Kelly and I talked about this and we think it's important because we did have a pretty good discussion about this, that we add a statement about oversight and communications. And Peter, I already shared this with you, but I will read it to the group to see if people are amenable to this modification at the end of the parade debrief. Holly okay. discussed confusion in the community as to who is planning and overseeing 350 events. The 350 Steering Committee is the appointed authority for the Town of Deerfield and all events and communications for town sponsors, town sponsored events need to be vetted by the Steering Committee. This will avoid future issues. So that's the, that's the modification, that's the addendum. That's that will show up under your parade report. Is that the Yes. That, that's the idea. All right. Just to have it recorded in the minutes. All right, any uh, discussion about the amendment? Nope, all That's right. Good, clar good clarification. Move with the, move with the amendment. Um, all those in favor of the uh, 26, June 26 meeting um, records as amended, say, please say aye. Aye, Diane Martin. Aye, Kelly Shrest. Hi, Carolyn Ness. Hi, Holly Mankowski. Okay, passed. I will so change the uh, draft. Thanks, Peter. Yep. All right, moving on. The next agenda item is the Eastern European Heritage Festival in October update. Um, I just want to say a few words first, and then I'm going to ask Jean to uh, uh, present more details. Um, this was originally 
essentially Jean's idea. Uh, through, but she was looking to do it through a grant process with the, I think it was the Mass Council on Humanities. And we got to thinking about the appropriateness of what she wanted to do for the 350th event. And so we kind of worked together to, um, to talk about it. And uh, so I agreed that I would be the liaison between the steering committee and, and and the and the, the event, and since then Diane's joined in the planning process, um, and we've got some other people from the PVMA staff along with Jean that uh, have joined us, and I and I think uh, it's moving along very well. Um, and thanks to other people, I know Holly, but uh, and others have uh, submitted or or sent out queries or questions to people. Uh, about it and they've gotten back to me by emails and that's been helpful as well. Um, just so we are, are clear about the, the title that we finally selected for this. Um, one of my, Jean's idea was they were, they were really focusing on Eastern European heritage and I was thinking to myself, well, maybe it's an opportunity to bring in other groups as well. So I wound up doing some, my own research, trying to find heritage groups for the Irish and the Germans. These are our other two primary immigrant groups that came in. They came in in the 19th century and one of the interesting quirks of history is we basically lost most of those families in 1896 when Greenfield adopted Cheapside or annex Cheapside. Most of those families were associated with the railroad and the industry that had grown up north of the Deerfield River. But anyway, I started looking around to try and find organizations that we might be able to tap to bring something of the Irish and the German heritage here. And I couldn't find anything locally at all. Um, it may be from just lack of knowledge, but so long and the short of it, we've decided that we would really focus on the Eastern European heritage for this festival. And if I can, I'll try and work in later programs that bring in um, the other immigrant groups. And we may be able to do this uh, through oral history programs and that sort of thing. So anyway, um, that's what, um, that's where I am. So I would ask Jean to, I guess, come on now. We've got a pretty, good program and we've had some couple of really positive responses in terms of would you be willing to participate in this event? So um, Jean, if you wanna take it away. Um, I was just trying to uh, share my screen with you. I've created a two page flyer about the weekend. Saturday is on one side and Sunday is on the other. Um, and obviously each day the little updates kind of change. Um, the good news is that on Saturday, we have the Eddie Foreman Orchestra, and we have several um, artisans, Susan Urban and Vecislava Bogdanska, and she's actually from Poland and comes with her own translator. She makes beautiful crepe paper flowers. We've got the Polish Genealogy Society of Massachusetts, the Polish American Foundation, uh, we're working on getting some vendors with um, amber and Polish items for sale. Um, our museum ed staff is working on family activities uh, for children and adults of all ages. And one of our museum staff will do a brief, probably like 20, 25 minute program about um, the process of immigration, especially through Ellis Island. And it's designed for a fourth grade classroom and it can be adapted to the general public. Uh, we're going to have displays of Eastern European immigrant photos and artifacts, uh, many of which Peter has been making and collecting through the oral history project, but also some things from local families and possibly some religious icons from um, the Polish priest from Turner's Falls. We're hoping to have a couple of trucks that have some farm produce for sale. That's still being investigated. Um, 
the Friends of Deerfield, my son Alex Hirschenretter, is also working on um, seeing if we could have a cash bar with beer and wine from Berkshire Brewery. Uh, we plan to have raffle and door prize drawings, uh, ref free refreshments of um, Ukrainian Polish desserts and beverages, and then the option for people would be to get a Polish plate from Bernat's Polish Deli that includes galumki, two pierogi, and cheese pierogi, kielbasa, kabusta, and rye bread. And we're working on a vegetarian option. Um, the little conflict with that is that um, the caterer needs to know how many meals to prepare. So um, although all the events would be free, people would have to prepay for the luncheon, which is $15 by October 8th. Um, our museum will also be open um, on Saturday and people can take a self-guided tour of immigrant items in our collection. On Sunday, we'll be at Frontier Regional School and we have the Piast Polish dancers from Webster, Massachusetts, and you can see their picture in the mm -hmm. lower left corner. Um, I've been working to try to get the Ukrainian folk dancers, so Holly has given me some leads and I've emailed those people. I'm hoping to hear back one way or the other. Um, Dr. James Pula will be speaking on the Kosciuszko Squadron. Um, it's creation after World War I, they were trained by American fighter pilots and then their role in helping win the Battle of Britain during World War II. Um, then Peter has arranged for a moving, movie showing of Ron Fulton's Root Hog or Die, and it's a story of farming in this valley. Uh, we'll also have more displays of Eastern European photos and artifacts and um, refreshments, Polish, Ukrainian, Jew Jewish desserts, um, beverages, and I believe that will be catered by Kathleen Tomas. Um, from Greenfield. And so that's what I've been working on. And PVMA is very committed to doing this. And we really want to, you know, um, have a great festival. And Peter had been talking about the Irish and the German immigrants. And um, there's a man named Dennis Picard who does a program called Patty on the Railroad. Um, and perhaps that's something that could happen later in October or November. And there's also the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage in Greenfield that does some programs about the Russell Cutlery, which a lot of the German immigrants had worked on. Um, there's some research that's been done about the German immigrants who served during the Civil War, um, a couple of whom were killed during the war, and they are commemorated on the Civil War monument um, in the Green and the Old Deerfield Village. So I'm very appreciative of everyone's support and ideas and suggestions. I think it's a great group of people and we're really looking forward to it. So any questions? Holly. Jean, Jean yeah. I just had one question. Um, sure. With Ber Bernat's doing the food, I know in the past Bernat's has done a food truck where you could just go up and order whatever you wanted versus a prepared plate. Are they not doing something like that anymore? Correct. I, that was the first thing that I asked them because I've seen okay. their food truck. And the man just said they simply can't get the help to run the truck. Okay. So they're treating this like a as a catered event. Okay. Because um, I don't know if it's worth getting complicated with another food purveyor. But when I was at the Green River Festival, there was somebody who sold pierogies and you could add kielbasa to the plate. And they were all vegetable pierogies. So that would be, you know, a vegetarian option. Because I think they just had um, cheese and potato or just potato. I can't remember. Um, but they actually had a booth where you just ordered what you wanted. Um, do you want additional food vendors or not? Well, I'm not sure. I think the caterer, I had told him to plan for about 200 meals. Um, but people just have to prepay like they did for the chicken barbecue. Um, so I don't know what other people think. 
is it a turnoff to come there and not to have food if you didn't prepay or pre-order? Well, if you don't have a chance for someone to buy a lunch if they didn't pre-buy, then I think that gets awkward. It'll be advertised ahead of time though. Right, but a lot of people don't make up their minds to go and they just hear about it through somebody else and then they come, you know, kind of, you know, decide on Thursday I want to go and maybe there aren't any meals left. Because that happened with the chicken barbecue. A lot of people, you know, were more trying to decide at the end and and they were sold out, which was great on one hand, but on the other hand, then it didn't give people an option. No, maybe the thing to do, Holly, is not try and decide that tonight, but just send uh, Gene or send me the, the the vendor you were talking about and, and uh, what what you observed for the Green Festival, and we'll just work it into our planning discussions. Okay. Or or it could be someone who just makes something as simple as some type of you know kielbasa sandwich that can be you know pre pre made. I think the challenging thing about like a food truck is, I'm not sure how many people to tell them to plan on eating there. What if it's only 15 people? It may not be enough sales to justify coming. That's yeah. that's the challenge. Food trucks have to, to make the food truck uh, viable, they look for three to $5,000 minimum sales. Mm -hmm. Variable per yeah. room. Yeah, that's... That's quite a big volume, actually, when you try to think about it. So that's why, you know, it might work for the Green River Festival, but, you know, this is a much smaller scale thing, Holly. Mm -hmm. what, yeah, so what, does our, what does our town charge someone to come in to do a food truck? Um, it's a $150 uh, annual permit uh, from the Board of Health, $100 mm -hmm. from the uh, fire department, South Deerfield Fire Department, and then it is thirty-five dollars per event. So it's two eighty-five to start. Yes. Ooh. Okay. Anyway, the name of this is um, Jaju's Pierogi. They're at a Lynn Mass. We could always approach the Polish Club and ask them if they want to do something as a fundraiser. Is that a possibility? Um, they typically cool? don't do stuff off site. Okay. The reason why they don't do stuff off site is again because of um, you know permitting and food safety issues. Yeah. So well, when, I think we've when got a couple of potential options, but we'll just. I think it's something to discuss, but yeah. you have to realize that the volume and the you know, and and the space available and all that kind of stuff is is going to be more limited than in a, a big, you know, huge festival. The other thing is, <clears throat> sorry, the other thing that was part of this discussion is that there is a kitchen in the uh, elementary school that can use can be used by the caterer. Um, so there's you know, counter layouts is sinks, refrigerators, all of that stuff that, that is already in the premises that doesn't have to be brought in. But anyway, good idea. I will, um, I think we'll just look at that and, and see. I think the thing to do would be to just look at the, at, the ver at the variables that are needed, the costs and whatever, get a better handle on that and then maybe approach somebody else to say, well, given these circumstances, would you be interested in participating or not? Yeah, Diane. Uh, this one is actually for Carolyn having, she might be no more the answer. Uh, we were talking about having a farmer's market of all the businesses from Deerfield that make or grow or produce something in town, which would be uh, vegetables, fruits, meats, honey, and perhaps baked goods. What permitting process or application does anybody need uh, before we start approaching different people to ask them if they want to do something uh, at this um, 
October 14th event. Uh, is there anything they need to do or that we need to tell them they need to do before they think about for, it? For, for a farmer's market kind of thing, no. Um, any baked goods that are baked off premises are hopefully baked in a, you know, food safe kitchen, well, the, but they would be wrapped up and, and it would be identified. So the, the what you keep in mind, Diane, is just the ability to trace back if yep. there was a spoon board illness. So any kind of farmer's market is, is you don't have to worry about anything. It's just the baked goods you'd have to be able to trace. So it would be have to be uh, wrapped individually and then labeled as to where it came from. Okay. So that if we had to do a foodborne investigation, we would have some ability to backtrack it, that's all. Okay, so that makes it easier. I was a little reluctant to, does that include even meats? If they had it in a cooler? Even what? Meat. meat. Oh, meat. Well, if, if it's packaged from a farm, like, you know, they the already Cassies. sell it, like Yaswinski beef or the different Cassies. farms have, they're already pre-packaged and it's already labeled. So as long as the food custody, that is that the temperature, if it's frozen meat or in the cooler, it's you have the custody of the product is, is not, you know, traceable, compr okay. compromised at all, then there all is right. no issue. Again, it's, it's already prepackaged and labeled before it comes to the market. Okay, okay. that makes it easier to approach uh, different businesses that normally do not leave their stores and ask well, like, uh, an example would be diamonds farm if you sold their pot pies or some of their products they're already either frozen or refrigerated and they have their label on it those are perfectly fine a lot of our farm stands sell their diamond food but it's already pre-labeled and you know where's that oh, oh it's there a window window, window. Okay. Okay, I didn't think, okay. Chicken pot pies, all right. Diamond, demon. All right, we just say it differently. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, now I got what it is. <laughs> okay. Part of the reason for doing this has to do with the storms and we were thinking just, or I was at least one more outlet that people might be able to get a little more income having lost a lot of their crops already. Uh, I. The well, other thing is it, we could have some sort of a like a donation bin um, that, you know, people could make donations towards the farm relief, like, a you know, a giant pumpkin and people can put money in there or whatever. Yeah, that's an mm -hmm. option. Something yeah. even if yeah. only even if only two people come two trucks come, you know, we could have some sort of a fundraiser for them. Yep. No, that's good. That's a good idea. I think I think it will, one of the problems is Peter. It's not so much the farms don't have an outlet for selling; it's they don't even have product. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I I would sort of approach them on the question. Well, would you like to come just to advertise, you know, the farm or bring produce if you've got it? Because you're absolutely right. I mean, some may not. Um, right. I was you know I was wondering about that tonight because we had corn on the cob. It was absolutely delicious, but I think they can sell it because it was above the level of the floodwaters, so it didn't get contaminated. But I was wondering what happens. Do they do they cut stocks for sweet corn as fodder? Because uh, that, that's they're where just, it might get involved. Uh, they're 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 any we've condemned everything that had floodwaters, and they are disposing it in different ways. Some are just, um, you know, like some of the cabbages are just getting plowed under. Corn mm -hmm. that has already, you know, gotten to the point where it can't really be plowed under, that's chopped up and just then disposed of. Wow. The earth okay. wins this year. Mm, so sad. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is, it's really I tough. I have a question, Diane, with what you're looking on um, farmer's market and then I think Carolyn mentioned maybe baked goods. I know 
put my other hat on for South Deerfield Women's Club. We have a bake sale. Uh, well, it's it's been every year, every other year. Um, if the Women's Club was interested in doing a bake sale table to complement other people's stuff, um, right. is that a conflict? Because I know Jean talked about more ethnic desserts and that being available. It's still South Deerfield. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's fine with I mean, me. Just what are what are the food regulations? That's all. Yeah, wrapped and labeled. Yeah, I think the only uh, reason for the focus on the food was simply the theme of the festival. It, okay. it wasn't to keep people out. I mean, if there's if there's other ways that we can insert some other stuff into the festival that makes sense for the festival, I'm. I don't think it has to be necessarily Eastern European. Um, I mean, the farm festival, yeah, we got, you know, Eastern European descended farmers for sure, but, you know, you can invite Clark's apple orchard and, and that, I, I don't think that has any negative connotation or, you know, detriment to a, a festival that focuses on Eastern European heritage. Yeah, well, I mean, like Atlas Farm, I mean, you know, they're part of the community. Right, and I think that's, I, I would say a festival, oh, you know, just is open to anybody like that if you've got ideas. So, you know, if you want to talk to the women's club and, and get back okay. to it, great. I was thinking of the St. Anne's Sodality. They're, if they have, if they were going to have a polka um, pierogi festival and just make pierogies, but that would be interfering with burnout. And I wouldn't want to do that, you know, conflict. Oh, well, yeah. What they what they could do was um, like the Ukrainian church. I don't think they've had their bazaars recently, but at Christmas and Easter, you could um, pre-order the um, pierogi, and they came to you frozen in packages, well, and so you an could idea. you could take them home. And I, okay, so they weren't, you know, you couldn't eat them at the bazaar, but you took them home and unthought them for your dinner. So if they had a little table to sign up for that kind of thing at the festival, that would work okay, right? Yep. Or actually have them ready to just take home. <clears throat> or yeah, well that too. Okay. Uh, I mean, towards the end of the day, it, it it's due to run from I think noon to five, and if people stay on for events and stuff like that, uh, they might want to not want to buy them at noon and have them sit outside, not in the cooler and whatever, but. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity for that. Jean, I think you have the first page up with or your sharing. Can you show us the second page? Yeah, you've got Sunday up. There you go. Yeah, let me just see if I can make the view bigger. Oops, too big. So this is Saturday. This this is just kind of a placeholder. It's a picture of my grandparents' wedding in 1907. But um, trying to get a few more pictures. Um, one lady, the uh, Susan Urban, had sent me a, a picture that I think I'm going to put there instead. So um, I did have a question about the cash bar. Is there a permit that has to be obtained from the town to sell that beer if the uh, friends at Deerfield want to do that? Yes, and they'll they'll handle it. We waive the fees, but um, uh, we this way it's covered from under liquor liability and that kind of stuff. Okay. And I think the Berkshire Brewery people have someone who, uh, what is it called, tips trained to yes. serve alcohol? Yep, so that's good. All right, I think we need to move on, but we're still going to be exploring this. So if anybody's got any ideas after sure. we get through the meeting or whatever, just send them on to Gene or myself. And yep, send them along. We'll put them in the hopper. Thank you, Gene, for all your hard work. Oh, you're welcome. I love doing it. Thank you, Gene. This looks really exciting. Yep, we're making progress. Okay, the next uh, item up here is Treehouse Half Marathon Update. I suspect Ashley's on here for some reason. Or... Allison. Allie. Yeah. Hi. Yes, I'm Hi. Uh, 
I'm just here to check in with you all and again remind you how excited we are that uh, our events aligned and we, you know, we finally got the ball rolling to host a marathon the same year you guys are hosting your 350th. So at the the timing, in my opinion, couldn't have been better. I'm, you know, really excited to be a part of your event calendar. And, um, you know, it, it kind of gives us a reason to be hosting a half marathon as well, which is great. Um, and I just wanted to check in with you all and let you know that we've been working closely with the police team um, to make sure that this is the least amount of disruptions possible for the town. Uh, we have made the start time 830 to ensure that it's done at a reasonable time, both for runners to finish and consume a beverage, but also for you guys to get back to your normal activities. There will be, um, as far as I'm aware, almost no road closures except for River Road. Um, we're going to try to stay in as much breakdown lane as we can, taking over as little street as possible with cones along the side. Um, and then I think just a segment of River Road will be closed because we're doing an out and back loop. So we have to close that, unfortunately. Um, we are in the process this week of sending out communications to really engage uh, with anyone who is interested in volunteering. Um, so if you know anybody or if there's anyone that has reached out to you at all, please let me know um, and we can get them to our volunteer page, which hopefully is going live this week. And um, we will have about, I want to say, 250 volunteers. Yes. Do the volunteers get t-shirts? They do yeah, get a t-shirt. Like, they always like carrots. It is, it is, it is carrot colored as well. It is safety orange. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> it, uh, but it, it's got a really, really cool design on it, but we wanted to also make sure that uh, our volunteers were seen so that when they're on the road, it wasn't as dangerous. And um, Ali, can I ask if, um, if those uh, t-shirts I'm, I'm sure they have a treehouse logo on it because I know how you guys market, but do they also have the Deerfield 350th logo somewhere on it? They do not. Um, I can work with that, but I think we already ordered them. So I don't know if we can add it now, uh, but we can figure out a way we're going to be having water stations. And that's kind of where I was thinking we could have some 350th signage. Okay. Along the route and then also at the actual brewery day of as well. Okay. Where was the sign? It's not. It's not. It's not obvious right now, but I know it's early planning in terms mm -hmm. of you know, just trying to get entries and registrations and all that. But it, it, the connection with the three fifty, if I didn't really know how you were going to do that from a marketing mm -hmm. promotion standpoint. Yep, it'll be a uh, sort of signage um, on our end, and I think we're added to your calendar, and that is as far as Caroline and I have gotten. But if anybody has, you know, recommendations, please let me know. Well, maybe one of the things that you can do on your webpage itself that's advertising the race is just to indicate that you're coordinating this mm -hmm. event with Deerfield's 350th anniversary. So it's kind of right up front. Absolutely. And then that makes sense for why you've got them as the signage and, uh, you know, why it's on our web page. I was, I talked to Chris earlier about that, but I think that's one of the things I, I want to try and keep events that go on in town focused. If it, if we're putting it on the 350th web page, we sort of have to have a reason why we're doing that. Absolutely. And, and so I think that makes it clear that, you know, they're in conjunction with one another. You know, essentially, Deerfield's 350th is your first birthday for the run. Exactly. And maybe oh, that's cool. to maybe that's to deal with it or in a way mm -hmm. to present it. Exactly. Yeah. This, is, a this is the birth of the marathon. There we and go. Maybe, and maybe we can uh, have a link to the 350th page in case people want to know what other events are happening, like Heritage sure. Week or something. I should add that I've not added this to the website because I've gotten no information on it. So, yeah, I'm that's my fault, Kelly. I've got a tentative program worked up and I, I just sent it to you and everybody else on the committee. Okay. Uh, so, 
that was one of the items that was on there. So we'll we'll work on modifying that particular uh, item on the calendar. Um, so I, I we'll work on it further, but I think that's a you know just if we can bring the two events together, I, I think we've got it's positive on, for both of us. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really bummed out that we hadn't met prior to the uh, t-shirt ordering because I think that having it on that shirt would have been awesome. But uh, now we now we know and uh, we'll figure out another creative way to get it on there. Well, yeah, I, don't, want... I don't know if you have a, excuse me, Peter, sorry. Um, no. But I don't know if you have, when you give out a package for, you know, with their uh, placards for their number in the race or whatever, if you're going to have like a goodie bag or anything like that, but uh, maybe we can do magnets or something like that with the 350th logo. Okay. You know, yeah. I mean, thrown in those bags too. Yeah. I think that would be helpful or on the bib or something like that. Um, we could definitely make something work for sure. Put a, put a, put a logo on the bib. Yeah. I mean, good as on the we, shirt. We probably yeah. could do it. With, we probably could do it with uh, Velcro. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, you, you, you know, uh, I'm sure the marathon organizers know how to make bibs and all that stuff, but they might have to just be stuck on it, you know, rather than mm -hmm. embroidered or anything. Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll talk to the team. I think I meet with them again next Monday. So I'll talk with the team about options for, or what, what they know as like sort of the best way to get that out, whether it is uh, an add on or if it's on the bib itself or, or something like that. So we'll, uh, we'll discuss that. And um I, you know, I can let you guys know where we where we landed, but I do think um, I will coordinate with our team to figure out a way of getting the websites to talk and, you know, have the promotion on our website that it is um, sort of celebrating the 350th. And do you have a, do you have an initial count on registration so far to run? We to actually are run? maxed out. So the only way at this point to uh, attend the event aside from hanging out roadside is to um, be a volunteer. Um, so if anybody asks, uh, but we are at about 2,100 runners and um, oh, I think 500 you. spectators, maybe, maybe 400. Amazing. So, so, where <laughs> are all these, so where are all these people staying? To be perfectly honest, I mean that is. I think a lot of we have um some hotel blocks in the Amherst area, and um a lot of Hadley has hotels along um, Route Nine, and we have uh the majority of people are actually parking at UMass, and they're going to get a chartered bus over to the brewery, so that traffic day of is not hopefully not crazy. Okay. That's great. Yeah, Allie, great. two questions. Um, yeah. One, remind, remind me of the date. September 17th. It's a Sunday morning. Okay. And the time for the race? The race will start. Uh, the, you know, the actual start is 830. Uh, okay. But I think people will be uh, being start started shuttling around 6 a.m. Just so that okay. they're at the start line and, you know, ready to go. Okay. Um, and, and how will people volunteer? Where, where would they go if they're interested? So that would be all um, communicated. We haven't actually set up that portal, but it would depend on what they sign up for. So there's options to be, um, you know, a water person along the route and you would go to that location. And then there are also options at the brewery itself, whether it's, you know, t-shirt, um, like people were able to purchase a t-shirt so you could, you know, hand those out, help with the bib pickup and things like that as well at the brewery. And how would you sign up? That would be on our race roster website. Um, and I can give um, the link to you all um, or to Peter, if that's easier, after we yeah. meet. You send um, it to me, I'll send it out to everybody. That should be live later this week. But I think right now, even we have just a general inquiry, you know, I'm interested in volunteering and then we'll reach out to them directly, anybody who did that general form. Because we could put that on our webpage as well. Oh, I'll okay. To that. That would be awesome. And I don't know if anybody, you know, if there are any groups in town that are looking for sort of community service hours, or we're trying to think of a creative way for those that are at the water stations to kind of 
want to be there and be excited about being there, whether it's a decorating thing or, or something along those lines. So we're looking into some ways of making that a, aside from a t-shirt, a more exciting reason to be volunteering. Diane? Okay, first I want to apologize. The pot belly pig that's been loose on our street was just in the front yard with my dog. Uh -oh. They were 10 feet apart, both waving tails, but the dog was barking. So that's why I kept leaving. And I totally have to apologize for that, of the leaving the meeting. Uh, what I was going to ask is, is there an age um, restriction on who can run it at your brewery? Is this something you can open to the track team? So it's, it wasn't, it's not that we're limiting it. It's not encouraged, but it's not limited. And we are offering uh, several non-alcoholic options day of the race as well. Um, so I don't know if we're, we're explicitly advertising it. I think I would like to have um, any volunteer be 18 or older just because it's a brewery and the alcohol, I think you can legally serve alcohol at 18. I, not as a volunteer, but as a runner. Oh, it's already sold up. There's no spaces left, Diane. Oh, you've sold everything. Oh yes, yep. Okay, I okay. I they, they had fifteen hundred gone. They had okay. fifteen hundred gone immediately. Excellent, excellent for yes. you also then. Then they expanded okay. it to twenty one hundred, and it it just went. And it just went. that went in a weekend. Yeah, it was. Um, and you know we had to Carolyn uh from through the select board you know, had to deal with our creative solutions for figuring out how to get more, more occupancy along it because it, uh, the, the first wave of 1500 sold out in less than 24 hours. Oh, cool. Very so, cool. Just <laughs> so Carolyn, do the taxes go up next year with this, uh, massive herd <laughs> running over Deerfield Road, so we have to repair them? <laughs> No, hopefully we'll find some creative <laughs> ways to fund the construction of the roads, and hopefully River Road will not fall into the Connecticut River. Oh uh, boy, race! <laughs> Keep them off a of pine nook. Oh yes. Will you that section far away from the river? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, thank you, Allie. That was a nice report out, and thank I think you. we made. Allie, are you going to do any music event that day in the afternoon? Yes, I believe Mike is coordinating. We have an MC as well as a band. Um, that's I think it's just a, a cover band. Um, I, I believe okay. they're local, but I'll have to check with Mike on uh, who is actually playing. And and I'm in touch with him, and I, I just need to follow up. I know he was on vacation mm -hmm. um, because I've asked him if Friends of Deerfield could have a 10 by 10 tent. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I know. I don't know where we stand as far as the tenting, but I know we're offering some tents at the sort of near the finish line. So I would, uh, if you don't hear back from him, please let me know and I can bring that up. No, no, he's, he's always great, but I didn't want to bother him on vacation. Fair enough. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for your time. And um, as you know, if anything comes up or if anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And hopefully I can answer them quickly. All righty. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thank Allie. You. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, could I just say one more thing? Sure. I forgot about uh, the Eastern European Festival. Um, Deerfield, uh, sorry, Eagle Brook School has generously uh, lent us their tent, the big red and white striped one that we use for the craft fair. It's 40 feet by 80 feet. And so even though it's their parents weekend, they're going to leave the tent there to help out the um, 350th Deerfield celebration. So I just want to give them a shout out to for their generosity. Wow, that's really nice. All right, um, moving on, uh, working history group update. Um, I guess I'll do a quick run here. Um, July 6th, I gave a talk um, in Old Deerfield on the world of the Pocumtuck. Uh, I was part of the first talk in the Historic Deerfield the Summer Speaker Series. Um, we had about 80 people show up in the community center and 200 people uh, zoomed in. So it uh, reached out uh, July 13th, Colin Calloway gave a talk. 
of the 1735 Deerfield Conference in, uh, in Deerfield. It's where Governor Belcher met with about 60 uh, Native American groups and, and had a conference. And uh, Colin gave a wonderful talk using that as the basis, but talking about Native American diplomacy and all the promo protocols and expectations and how they were done. It was, it was very well done. Uh, July 20th, Margaret Grushek uh, gave a nice talk on uh, Native Americans in the Connecticut Valley during the 19th century. Um, we've got two talks scheduled coming up. Um, I'm gonna give one, so if you're not totally absorbed in uh, running and the brew afterward on the same Sunday, the 17th, I'm gonna give a talk at the high school on King Philip's War uh, as it come to the, came to the Connecticut Valley and we'll explore that and Bloody Brook. And part of the reason for the selection of the date is the next day, uh, the 18th is the anniversary of the Bloody Brook fight uh, in what's now South Deerfield. And then uh, Kevin Sweeney is gonna give a talk on the French and Indian Wars. Um, and really what he's gonna do is there's a whole century of wars that goes on, but what he want, what I asked him to do is look at how these periods of war really affected the frontier town of Deerfield. So that'll be a nice um, addition. So if I talk about King Philip's War and then he'll follow up on the, the wars afterwards. Um, I wanna draw your attention to a photo and art exhibit uh, that focuses on Deerfield houses uh, documented in early photographs and the artwork that was inspired by them. Uh, that's on display until the end of uh, August in the South Deerfield town offices and at Memorial Hall, it'll be on display there in September and October. Uh, and finally, I just, uh, ran into Judith Anglazy, who was the artist that uh, presented the mural uh, to us for uh, approval. And, and uh, she's got all the materials together and she's trying to finish raising the funds for that. Uh, she's really anxious to get going. So I think by the end of the fall, we'll have a mural in place. Yeah, Diane. Uh, did she do the uh, mural for Shelburne Falls? I don't know. You know, I was up there. That one's uh, beautiful. There, there are a number of them in Shelburne Falls. Uh, I got two pictures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't think so. I think she's a. It, it's a different. It's still in. Uh, uh, Krill, uh, uh, mosaic pottery. Yeah, mosaic pottery, ceramic mosaics. Uh, but um, she's got a really distinctive art form. Uh, but. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, the design was excellent and the coloring and everything else. It looked so, nice. It was uh, very beautiful. Kevin, uh, because it's a, a veneer, a brick veneer on the town, town hall currently, we're going to frame it and then put it on the outside, uh, you know, where it's protected under the, where the benches um, now as you enter the town hall. And then if we do renovate, the 1888 building at some point we can move it over to there yeah. permanently so yeah. um, i'm excited because i think it's you know it's a really nice 350th it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to, to, to see the uh, the other thing is um just in terms of the history working groups and stuff like that november and december is still open so if any of you have any ideas of what you would like to see as a, a program, um, please get in touch with me because we'll, we'll see what we can do to meet the request. You have a Christmas party or holiday party in December. <laughs> oh, you know. uh, so we're going to have to drink hard, hard, hard cider and, and aged old beer. Is that the deal with this <laughs> if it's a history, history working group? I mean, well, the other thing is that November and December are still open in terms of anything. 
not just history programs, but uh, you know, activities or events that uh, people would like to see happen. Um, it's time to begin planning or at least thinking about it. And uh, if we, you know, want to, I've heard a number of ideas. I think part of it is, well, do we do them as individual programs or do we do them as some other kind of event? Um, it's, you know, some, some things that we've thought about would seem to go better with if, if people were drawn to a particular location to have that there rather than that's going to be the draw to bring people in. I mean, the speaker series, you're interested in history and you like to go to talks. I mean, that's a, one way to do it. And it's the talk that's the draw. Although I tell you, if I'd been to two of them and Friends of Deify had put on the kind of spread they put on after every one of these talks, um, I might come to the talk for the meal. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Yeah, you know, the the food is just excellent, and it's it's really nice when you can get together and sit down afterwards. We get table and chairs out in the halls, and people sit around and and yeah. talk, and we can visit and talk about the talk, or we can talk about other things, and and it's a really nice little community uh, endeavor. Uh, yeah. So if you haven't been, I would encourage you to to go to at least one or two more, and um, we. I, I think we could do more if uh, if people were interested. I've been trying not to stretch myself too thin, but uh, you're familiar enough with me that you know I've got a sort of a gift of gab, so I, I don't I don't mind doing them if I've got some free time to prepare. Um, I think so, the fact that they are um, televised, you know, that they're recorded. And they're part of, of, you know, archives that are available for people to watch when they're, if they want to go back is, is, is wonderful. Cause that's, I think Peter, the number of people who've commented the fact that they want to go back and like Gary Sanderson's talk, go back and, you know, listen about the houses or something. I mean, it's very interesting. That's good. Yeah. We could build on there. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about is that, I've got a number of papers that I've written. I haven't published them anywhere. I just write them, but on different mm -hmm. topics. And I was wondering about a, a way, not so that I present them in a, you know, a talk kind of series, but did almost like a, a, the library does where you read a book and then you get together and discuss. And I'm wondering if I put a couple of papers down in the library and said, okay, you got a month to read these and we'll get together on the 10th of December and sit down and uh, you can ask as many questions as you want based on the, you know, whatever the topics of the papers were. Like a book club? Yeah. It's a book reading. Book reading. Okay. Yeah, or, rather than, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to give you a book to read, but it may be it's a 20 page to article. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Do you, do you think, Peter, that the library could put them up electronically, which would help people who maybe are a little more housebound, so they could read it and then? Oh, yeah. yeah, they're all yeah. digital. I mean, I, that, they just make copies. They just post a Word doc. Yep. Um, they could be posted. They could be posted on our website too. Our site. I was going to say, why not through our site? It gets people in the yeah. habit of going back to the site. Well, we yeah. could do that, and, and then uh, also, you know, just set it up. I, library's kind of small right now for that kind of thing, but you could do it in the town hall if we had a, you know, an afternoon or something like that, and people could show up and get forty people. And I suppose you could even hook it up with Zoom the way you do select board meetings and have people call in or come in yes. on questions. Yep, I mean, you can do that. I'm willing to try, I'm willing to try it at least see if it you know if it works but uh, we will have the idea of film fcats filming each one of these talks so we we're, we've captured it but there's some editing and stuff that needs to be done and we just haven't had the time to do it yet but they'll be available later on later on in the year uh, for 
public distrib distribution and showing. So, all right, well, I guess we're gonna move on to new business. Uh, Chris, this is updates from Friends of Deerfield. You wanna give us a summary? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> um, I think the first thing I'd like to talk about is, is what's coming up. Um, uh, we're, we're definitely going to support the speaker series. And I think there's four dates between September and December identified. Um, and um, so we'll be supporting you with refreshments and facilitating that. Um, we committed to supporting PVMA and the 350th steering committee on Sunday afternoon, October 15th at the high school for all those events. Um, and it may be a fairly long afternoon. So we're taking Gene's um, recommendations for food and working with the caterer to make sure we've got it covered from noon till five on that. Um, the, the other thing that we're looking into, and it's really a cost estimating exercise at this point, is in thinking about when, when you, you eventually bury the time capsule, whether that will happen this year or early next year, um, a, a commemorative granite stone. So we're looking into that because it's a long lead time item too. So it's not just the cost estimate, it's a lead time issue in terms of um, uh, where what will go with it on top of the ground versus what's underneath the ground. Um, and then uh, and then we are we are still committed because we publicly announced this to um, whether it's in in conjunction with the recreation committee, et cetera, that uh, in which event it'll be or whether it'll be a totally separate like family day event. But you know we owe hot dogs, hamburgers soft drinks and ice cream because we had to cancel the post parade stuff because of the rain um, back on June 7, 17th it was, I think, uh, I can't remember. Yeah, it was 17th. And so, um, so, so, you know, that's all the upcoming stuff. Um, I just kind of wanted to give you an update from a financial standpoint. Uh, we've dispersed in the last year, uh, over $121,000 in expenses. Whoa. And um, and we raised over $100,000 of that. Some of it comes through raffles and you know bar sales and things like that, silent auctions. But in terms of donations, we have topped 100,000 at this point. Um, so actually we're, we're supporting um, Judith with the mural project that she can use our 501c3 to run her donation through it. And we've just asked her to tell us who she's soliciting funds from, just in case we have to go out and get some supplemental income. We want to make sure that we're not double dipping and creating confusion on that. Um, so so we'll work together with her on that, on that, on that ceramic mural project. She can use our entity and we'll get the funds to her, but we just want to make sure we know whose door we're not, each of us are knocking on if we have to go back to the well. Um, and so um, the only outstanding thing, you know, is this kind of leftover from, I'll say the first half, which kind of runs through the middle of July for us is um, even though back in January, February, we um, budgeted for extra police, we budgeted $640 actually. Uh, and that was based on doubling or tripling what we paid for the Jubilee for extra police support. Um, as it turns out, because of all the commitments that had to be made and all the contingencies that had to be handled, we actually um, paid out 36.30 in fire support and 40, $4,080 in police support. So versus that initial budget of $640, we actually paid out $7,710. And I've officially come back to Peter and Carolyn, and I had had this discussion with Carolyn before the mid-June events, because I, I saw what was gonna happen in terms of total cost. And I came back with an invoice to the 350th steering committee of the town of Deerfield of $2,570, which is one third of that cost. 
that we paid out, which was way over budget. And uh, because I think we had to do certain things to benefit the town to execute these events on that June 17th, 18th weekend, I'd still like your committee to consider reimbursing us that. Uh, and that positions us to make sure we can handle all the other events that we're committed to the rest of the year. I just had a quick question. I apologize, uh, Chris, that I didn't have a chance to call you back because I could not connect with Brenda just to find out what was going on. But I believe the 3,600 or something was paid by the town already. Um, yeah, for, for all the parade, the closures, et cetera, like that. We probably were on the hook for the Pelican protection. Uh, for right. during during the parade okay. that day. Um, so yeah, the police is. is covering probably up near the, it's the high school area, the Pelican area for the parade. Plus on the 18th, there was probably some special police for the fireworks, probably to manage that. And then the fire was definitely related to the fireworks. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, you already paid for all those street closures, all the traffic management for the parade, et cetera. I was just gonna say, I'm not clear on the money yet, but I whatever works out and there's no problem from the town, uh, you know, however we figure this out, okay? I just wanna make clear that it's not an issue. It's just trying to account for where it goes or from where it comes from, you know, as yeah. a child. So it's not an issue. So our part, our part was um, was police coverage for around Pelican, probably for the parade um, because of the special commitments we had to make, uh, and then the fireworks night in South Deerfield, and also the chicken barbecue. Yeah. and managing the whole year of situation because of all the competing events. Yeah. That's on the police side. The fire side is very related to fireworks and all the commitments we had to make to get um, the butters to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. What was the figure on the fire side? Sorry. Was... $3,630. Oh, I got it right. And okay. on the police side, it was four thousand eighty dollars okay. for a total of seven thousand seven hundred ten. And literally in our in our budget, when we set out for all these events, we had six hundred and forty. Um, could I just make a comment about um, that lady Judith and the mural? Um, PVMA also is a fiscal agent for another entity. And when this person was trying to raise money for some of his projects, all those checks and fundraising things came directly to PVMA. And I would suggest that all those checks that she's requesting be made payable to the Friends of Deerfield. And perhaps you set up something on your website where uh, if people wanna make online donations, they could direct it towards the mural project. Um, it can get complicated because some places need um, physical receipts. Um, and it would be best if you guys did those directly yourselves. Yep. Yeah, we've had to do that a number of times, Gene, for yep. Um, yep. other donors. Yep. So we've got templates set up to do that. And because the project is fairly modest in cost, I think she's just going to go target a handful of donors. And then we can work with them one on one to get it to run to friends of Deerfield and then get them documentation accordingly. Right. Because if someone makes out a check to, I don't know what her last name is, Judith, um, it may not qualify as a, a tax deduction. Absolutely not. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yep. Good. Chris, so because we were told uh, that we couldn't use Pelican at all during the parade because of their their company structure what was your involvement with pelican oh they had to have police there to keep people from going in there holly and parking and parking 
Well, because they have, because they have government contracts, they have certain security provisions for securing that entire location because of uh -huh. federal government secrets, et cetera. And so they are contracted with the federal government to secure that property a certain way. And okay. so we had to make sure it could not be breached. Who had to make sure? The town working with the Friends of Deerfield for any event, we had to make sure that could not be breached. Okay, but the parade was a town event. So I'm just, I'm confused where Friends of Deerfield was involved with that versus just the town. The Friends of Deerfield were sponsoring the police, some of the police coverage for that, the required police coverage. Because it tied into post parade activities as well as fireworks. And that was as much of a concern as the parade itself was. Okay, that was just never discussed. Yeah. So, like, that's something, I mean, as a parade work group, we should have even known about all of that before. Um, Holly, they did not want it to be discussed, and we shouldn't be discussing it in um, on an open meeting that's recorded, okay? Well, we're discussing expenses, so. I know, well, it's you're also, you're also oh. discussing security and government contracts. Yep. Yep. I, I understand yep. that, but I didn't raise the issue on the expenses, so. We're just, it's not to be worried about. It's gonna be covered uh, one way or the other. We'll sort it out. Hi, Chris, to move on. Uh, I have a question, the Treehouse Half Marathon. Who's paid for the police to, uh, Watch the roads on River and Hillside. My it's understanding is Treehouse is covering every Treehouse is, is it's covering every expense. Excellent. Okay. All right. We had already discussed that. So there we figured there wouldn't be a lot of money left over anyway, but um they have stepped forward for the entire expense. Okay. Thank you. Apologies. And we and and frankly our by request to Treehouse related to being on premises there that day, so we could sell some of our excess merchandise, et cetera. It's really just to promote 350th in general of uh, the town and to raise a little bit of money to, to shore up because I just told you we've spent 121,000 in expenses. So just to make sure that we can make it all the way through till the the new year it's like if we can monetize some of the uh, merchandise we have in inventory that's and promote the 350th that's what i've made the request to treehouse about chris um speaking of merchandise at the heritage festival uh gene has um used the logo or the pictures of the polish am i pronouncing it visanki the paper cutting which is a really beautiful design is there a chance that you can get bags for sale that have the Deerfield Thrifty, the 350 and the Polish artwork design on the same bag for sale, especially if we might be having a market where people might be getting merchandise, they might be inclined to get a not too expensive um, small grocery bag. You know, the, the little we, cloth ones we or something. We certainly could piggyback on the tote bag that we already have and just change that artwork and, and reorder. Um, okay. We plan, we plan, but we already talked to uh, Tim Newman's team in terms of, we plan to be friends of Deerfield at the craft fair uh, in the third week of September. And, mm -hmm. and we assume we can get rid of a lot of our inventory of our tote bags that just have the friends of Deerfield on one side and the um, Deerfield 350th logo on the other side. But we certainly could come up with a design and have remanufacture for that for the for for the mid October. But our idea is that by the end of September, we will hopefully liquidate most of our inventory of those tote bags. Okay, okay. I mean, I, I just made it. That, that's something to consider. Uh, people seem to be looking for things to buy, and it would be at, at the Heritage Fest. If, um, one more thing, and if they're if they're bringing things home like frozen pierogies or apples or something, well, whatever, um, to have a carry-all bag that they'd be inclined to buy, 
because they have things to carry. Yep, I, I, I got it. I just made a note of Heritage Fest on one, yeah. the, the and, 350th on one side and the Polish logo on the other side. Yeah, and what Jean, is, if you have them. I was just gonna say, what is the minimum number of bags you have to order for the tote um, bags? Actually, I had to look back because there there is like cutoffs for price points. I and see. I, but I don't, it's not major numbers. I mean, it's like a hundred or 150. Okay. You it's know, not it's like not, 500. <laughs> no, no, it isn't like okay. that. So okay. it's yeah. like, I think we could just hit a trigger point. Um, and, you know, you could, we sell them a little bit above cost right now, but we're open the friends of Deerfield for liquidating whatever we have to do at cost, right? Because because you know the cash is gone, so it's more important that people enjoy the merchandise and buy it rather than it sits in somebody's basement mm -hmm. or home, you know, and, and doesn't go anywhere. And so, so that's our attitude as friends of Deerfield. We're gonna we're gonna try to generate whatever cash we can and get this into people's hands and not be sitting in inventory somewhere. And so, so you know that could be a strategy for that. I mean, certainly. If we worked with, like for the Heritage Festival, if we worked again with Berkshire Brewing Company on setting up a bar, et cetera, the idea is to generate some money for PBMA. That is the idea. That would be the strategy. Okay, sounds good. Dean, what's the possibility? I mean, we're talking about the Heritage Festival here, but what's the possibility about the uh, PBMA's? Um, your own festival. Can't even remember the name of it now. Craft fair. The, 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 where all the vendors come. Craft fair? Yeah, September yeah. 23rd and 24th. <laughs> um, but what I was thinking about is that, um, I mean, we have two potential outlets for that bag or the design. One could be at the craft fair, one could be at the, uh, at the October. As advertising. Event. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah they're, I, the I, friends I, of Deerfield are going to have a booth there. Right. So, I mean, if they have that ready by September, sure. they could sell it there and at the Heritage. And find Correct. out how many you need. That's an idea. We used to do scout bags all the time, and people were always buying bags. We couldn't stamp enough logos on them. There was, that was a very big seller. So I'll, I'll volunteer at the craft fair. <laughs> Excellent. You need somebody to stand there and uh, sell bags. Yeah, we uh, we sold a lot last year, and so that's why we requested again to be there. Okay. Um, there's an item in here on 350th expenses. I'm not sure who has to have it put on. That's fine. Um, that was Holly. Okay. I, I put it on because, um, Peter, I stumbled on, and I'm sure it was left for you in the 350 mailbox, yeah. um, a, an outline of the expenses. And I know we've talked about going over this or actually looking at it, but have you seen it? Uh, I haven't updated this more, uh, this afternoon. So we're updated through um, the end of fiscal year 2023. So yes. you have you have a spreadsheet from the town? I do. Okay. Because there was other mail in that mailbox too. So I didn't even know if you were picking stuff up. I um, haven't been in there at all. Oh, okay. Well they, they just, left you. Um, because we've been getting the parade stuff through that mailbox, but there's been newspaper clippings and other stuff in there for months. Well, well, I'll go down and pick the stuff up. I it, it wasn't on my routine to do so. I never did it. Okay, I just thought that's where they left it for you. So they must electronically uh, gave it to you as well. Yeah, I just worked directly with Brenda and, and Pat and and uh, asked them for an update, and they just sent it to me on email. Okay, um, I just kind of wanted it on the radar because we're you know a little past the halfway point. Didn't know if we should be sharing that with the group and maybe just looking at our budgets of you know what we've allocated and where we're at well as far as uh now you've got a few more uh expenses for the parade is that right yeah just some incidental we had um 
thank you notes um, produced at the um, Franklin County House of Correction. And um, I've just got one more miscellaneous um, printing um, expense. So okay. well, you probably, want to give me a round number and I can just. Um, if I gave you just a quick guess, it's not more than a hundred, but probably closer to 50. Okay, I'm, I, I'm not worried about that at all. We are doing very well um, in large measure, thanks to Friends of Deerfield who has footed a huge amount of bills. Um, we still have approximately $27,000 in our budget. Okay. 27,000 left. Yes. We have spent uh, approximately 36,000. Now, we've also, off, and, and the 27, we're actually at 34.5, but we've authorized um, $7,000 towards the Heritage Festival. So I took that off. So we're at 20. The 27 is with the authorization of $7,000. Okay. So that's approximately where we are, about 27,000. We've been doing very well. And again, yeah, we've been doing excellent. I mean, you know, the 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 costs across the board uh, have um, certainly fall within the original parameters as we expected, and it's been delightful to be able to go beyond that. So, um, well, we're I, we're, in, we're in good shape financially, and and um, I I don't see any huge expenses. Over and above what we've looked at, so um, I'm pretty comfortable that we're going to be in a positive fund balance at the end of 350, uh, and you know can return some money to the town. But I said we've also got a lot of flexibility in the budget to put on additional programming. I th I, th I just want to say thank you again to friends of Deerfield because. When we started meetings back in 2019, we really did have a pretty hard uh, budget of about 100,000. And so truly the expenses have been far more than we anticipated from, you know, just things being more expensive. So, and we've done more things. I, I mean, we have a full calendar of events. So I I just want to, and we didn't we didn't anticipate the gala to be such, um, you know, taking so much money. Um, you know, it wasn't like that in the 300th. So I just want to thank friends of Deerfield, Chris and Alex and Stan. Everybody's been wonderful. Well, the way it, it kind of breaks out is that the initially, Every year for four years, we appropriated $10,000 towards the 350th. And the last appropriation was for 30,000 coming out of the special town meeting that happened just before the event. So we had 70,000. We're, we're just, and that was the, the idea there was that in case uh, an appropriate amount of money could not be raised over and above that to do the events we wanted. Um, that's where the 30,000 additional appropriation came. So we had 70. We're now about $4,000 shy of the $40,000 appropriations that we had done with the $10,000 per year. And we're going over that slightly into the the new appropriation. So we're, I mean, for the from the town's point of view, we've done very well, and and we couldn't have done that without the friends of Deerfield raising a lot of money. So in terms of town taxes, we're just about at the point where we've spent what was originally uh, authorized by town vote up to the point of the last appropriation request. So we're coming yes. right about where we where we were thinking. So I can I can tell you when we modeled out the 350th as friends of Deerfield, I said 
that it's going to cost 150 to 200 thousand dollars. And I said, between what the town has raised and what we have to raise, we're going to have to cover that. I mean, that that was where we were working from all along. And uh, there's two points. One is, friends of Deerfield, we've actually done more events than we planned in January and February. We did a lot of stuff around Founders Day weekend. Um, and, and, and the post-grade stuff was never in our original budget. And, we, you know, it's a good thing. We had some things left over that were perishable from that. And we've done stuff with the senior center. Uh, their look park picnic, for instance, recently. So, you know, because we're not going to let anything go to waste, right? I mean, that's just unacceptable. And so, so you know, I think that we did more events, um, and uh, I, I, I think that uh, the other strategy we had is how we price tickets for. The, whether it was the Jubilee dinner dance at the beginning or the chicken barbecue, we wanted to encourage maximum participation and reduce the cost for everybody. And so we knew we were taking a loss on every ticket we sold. But we did that strategically because we wanted to involve the community and we wanted to make it affordable to everybody. And so, so we've done a lot of things free, if you will, We've done other things that are discounted, um, et cetera. That was a strategy that we took as a board to, to in support of the community. Well, I think altogether, I mean, we've, we're, we're, we're doing well. Um, could I ask a question? Sure, sure. I'm also on the working group with the oral histories with Peter and Marie Thomas. And so PVMA has agreed to host the um, oral histories that have been created. And I just want to show you a quick picture of um, what's on our site right now. So this is one about Juanita Nelson. And there are different clips from different parts of her life, as you can see here. And so I, I need to meet with the committee so that we can set up a similar kind of template. But I wondered if the town would consider helping cover the costs of the website design and programming part to add those oral histories on our website. Um, we've got volunteers to work on the text and the pictures and the clips but we don't have the staff to do the website design template or the programming. And I don't have a figure for that. It may be like $1,500, but I could look into that if the town would consider that. Um, I certainly would be supportive of it, just personally. Maybe the thing to do, Jean, is just Try and come up with some budget figures. I mean, there's, it's it's open now, and that we have. Well, I just told you what basically the total budget would contain. I'm not saying we should go for broke and spend the entire budget. That's not my goal here. But if there's something that's central to the 350th uh, anniversary and celebration, and the continuation of the positive things that come out of this year. Um, I, I don't see why this the steering committee can't consider it. Um, do, you, do you know how many interviews have been completed? We've done about 25 right now. And, and I think okay. that part of what, uh, part of what I want to try and do with the oral history group is to get us back much more active the fall and into the winter. I mean, I see us as running beyond the 350th uh, to, to do those oral interviews, but the, with all of the activities that we've been able to, um, you know, produce and, and, and have to date, I think it's wonderful. I mean, we've, we've gone above and beyond what we, the, what we ever anticipated when we first started this committee and what the 350 was going to be about. Um, and I don't think we realized how much work it was going to be, um, which is, that's the way it goes. Um, Just a year. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think with the oral history, it's just been tough because it's not just 
doing the interviews, but running it through the transcriptions and getting it recorded and, and, and all the rest and archived and uh, it, it, it takes time to do. But uh, I, I think as the fall comes on and, and we're doing less of the large scale events, I think as I see it right now, the, the Heritage Festival is probably the biggest event that we're gonna have this fall, maybe not, Maybe I'll get surprised, but that's probably true, which means that we, some of us may have a little more time to put into other endeavors. Um, and But I, I think the long-term, the thing with the heritage is it's, it's sort of focused on the here and now. And I think part of what I hope to come out of the oral history program is moving into the future and using this as an impetus to get the oral histories so that we can carry that on beyond the 350th. So. Yeah, so I, our, I, I, our, our committee would need to, the oral history committee would need to meet and decide, you know, what sort of things they want to include for each template. And the web designer had suggested, you know, an image of the person, a very, you know, a brief biography. And then she suggested um, 15 minute clips at a time with what, with a little description of what's being talked about during those clips because she doesn't think that people are going to sit there and listen to an entire hour hour and a half no no talk. i don't think that was the so, old, old, right. i don't think that was the original intent of it either, right but right so we'll we have need... the i mean also most of these oral interviews go an hour i've got a couple that, that they run for two or three hours right that's a lot so we're it, it and that's the that's the critical time it takes to go through the oral interviews, figure out what the topics are, who said what, when, where, you know, and, and put it all together. And that takes far more time than simply doing the interviews. Okay. So that's why I'm looking to the, you know, to the winter months to pull that off. But we'll get, the, we'll get the oral history group together. I'm not, um, thanks for presenting it to the steering committee because it, it's, it's informative so they know what's going on, but. I think that's something we got to work out with the with the oral history committee itself. So, yeah, Chris. Um, I'm a big supporter of oral histories, and we've done similar things with military veterans going all the way back to World War II, but even more recent ones. And um, and that's the media that people want to see and that they relate to them. And uh, so it's totally within the scope of Friends of Deerfield in terms of our entertainment and educational mission uh, for the benefit of the townspeople, Deerfield, surrounding communities to support something like this. And I have no problem getting on the phone and calling in funding if we need it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, any more in terms of budget expenses? We, if you want, uh, what I can do is I can send you out a summary. I can send you all a summary. That sounds good. All right. So we're now at uh, new business. Anything uh, scheduled for the next meeting? I presume we're on October. August 28th, is that correct? That's the last Monday of the month. Yeah. Are we ever gonna meet in person again? <laughs> <laughs> we have cooties. <laughs> um, I don't know, are we? I mean, it, I, I'm the last one you wanna ask because I'm, I'm walkable. <laughs> I just walked down the yeah. street. Well, I think I, this uh, year, uh, Peter, uh, the problem is, is hybrid is more difficult. So, and Chris to participate would be hybrid. Oh, that's, that's true. And uh, also, it just, I have to say, there's still COVID circulating. Um, my uh, executive director that went to um, North Dakota for a conference of our uh, conservation districts came back with COVID. So, 
Um, it is circulating still. Yes, our, our daughter's a nurse at Cooley Dickinson and they get two to three calls every day still. Yep. Mostly from people who are traveling. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we originally made the accommodation for one of our members who hasn't been to meetings for probably a year ish, except for one. Um, so I, yeah, I'm just throwing it out. I'd rather in person meetings myself, but I'll go with the flow. All righty. So 28, uh, 6.30. And I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion, Carolyn. Oh, you made the motion. I'll second your motion. I'm faster <laughs> than you, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right. All those in favor? Hi, Kelly. Hi, Holly. Hi, Diane. Okay. All right. Return, folks. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing Good that. Night. Thank you, Pat. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Pat. Thank you for everybody. Bye, Jean. Bye, Chris. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye -bye.